Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first presentation of Legends of the Halls. I'm Diane Elstrom Devine, Development Officer with the Leadership Circles of Giving Program at the Museum of Natural History here in Santa Barbara, and we're so glad you could join us today. We're excited to be able to present this series, which focuses on some interesting past events and people of the museum and the impacts they had on shaping who we are today. Tonight's presentation is entitled, Whale in a Bottle, the First Sea Center. Some of you may remember our first sea center on Stearns Wharf, I know I do, and some may not. Regardless, it's an interesting story from start to finish, and we're so pleased to have our panelists, Gary Robinson and Sarah Edmund Sterner, here tonight with us to enlighten us. Gary is our museum's curator emeritus of facilities, having retired back in 2018 after devoting 32 years to our institution. He's a legend uh, himself. His first position with the museum was manager of the first Sea Center from 1986 to 1998. At that time, he moved on to the Mission Creek campus where he served as director of facilities until his retirement. Gary has a bachelor's and master's from UC Santa Barbara with an emphasis in marine biology. And during his tenure with the museum, he also had the opportunity to serve as a resident marine biologist at the Charles Darwin Research Station in the Galapagos. Sarah is currently an interpreter with the Sea Center, but her connection with the facility goes back to its early days. Sarah was with the first Sea Center between 1992 and 1999, serving as its first education coordinator and helped launch many programs that still have roots in today's Sea Center programs. Having spent her formative years in Miami, Florida, Sarah knew from an early age that she wanted to be a marine ecologist. Sarah's formal education took place at Wheaton College, and since that time, along with her work at the Sea Center, she's served as a marine biologist, worked with Jean-Michel Cousteau at Ocean's Futures Society, and started her own production company. We're so pleased to welcome both of them here this evening. During tonight's presentation, please feel free to send in any questions you may have through the chat tab at the bottom of your screen, and we'll cover as many as possible at the end. So now I'd like to turn it over to Gary and Sarah with Whale in a Bottle, the first Sea Center. Thanks, Diane. All right, thank you, Diane. Well, um, it's a pleasure. I don't know how many of you are out there uh, to have so many people in my house that I really can't see if you're in my house, but you might be looking at my, my wall and uh, the couple of the uh, fish prints behind me. Um, I wanted to point them out because they kind of represent my first uh, connection to the museum through um, some colleagues of mine. Um, Shane Anderson, who I worked for at UCSB for a number of years is diver collector. Uh, occasionally we would end up with some unusual specimens and Shane was interested in fish printing. And Eric Hochberg, who led the museum's invertebrate zoology department, uh, is a renowned uh, printer of nature art. And so we would get together, the first part of the museum I ever visited was the invertebrate zoology labs where we would lay out the fish and he'd show us how to print these and we'd all take turns. So the one on my, over my head, coming out my ear, is a um, wolf eel. And then the big scale pomfret, that's an unusual one. It's got quite a story with it. I'm just going to save it for later if there's any questions, but uh, those are my pride and joy, my first start with the, the museum. Um, later on, I actually became um, a teacher's assistant for Eric when he taught invertebrate zoology courses out at UCSB. And uh, so it's been a pleasure working with him in all my time at the museum. So whenever I got tired of my job, I could go visit a science department and really look at something interesting instead of, you know, this is broken or go fix this or where's the trash can, that kind of thing. So um, anyway, I really didn't want to start out this series for Diane, but you know, she put us first. And so I had, I had to look up what the legend is. I don't consider myself a legend. I'm living. I don't want to be a living legend. And so I looked up the definition to, to put me on the straight and narrow. So, um, a legend, a story that lies somewhere between myth and historical fact. Well, I think, you know, what I was thinking about, I was thinking about the Sea Center, you know, that's kind of a, a, a legendary start that is now continuing. 
And so kind of what happened in there, I didn't think of people so much or one person. Obviously, I don't think any one person deserves credit for really uh, forming the, the C Center. It's kind of an evolutionary process. Uh, certainly, Dennis Power uh, deserves a lot of credit for having the gumption and the initiative when the opportunity arose to say, here's a possibility of putting a satellite museum on the wharf. The wharf now being the number one tourist attraction in Santa Barbara, so certainly you'd want high visibility. Uh, and the concept made sense because our science departments really do have quite a bit of focus in the marine environment and connections locally. A lot of our collections are made up out of things that occur in the channel. So I wanted to shout out to that. And then of course, uh, Ruth Gable, who was the um, exhibits curator, uh, probably had a, a major role in the design and also all of the exhibit concepts and their design that went into the first C Center. Um, but other than that, you know, the whole museum, I'm sure all the staff, even before the time that I got involved with C Center, of all the departments had an integral role in kind of developing the ideas and concepts and, and what we covered. Um, so with that, I'm gonna open up our PowerPoint and we'll just take it and see where that goes from there. So, so um, this is a slide that I found that was taken by the exhibits department and it shows basically the floor plan of the first uh, C Center and a little maquette. This is a gray whale model. And the whole idea here was to um, design the building so that these full scale gray whale models would fit within this uh, large open space and people could get up close to a gray whale, so to speak, and actually look at and appreciate the size that they are and how they're put together and how they swim through the ocean. So the original design and you'll have to kind of, I'm sorry, if I have this cursor that's kind of hard to see, isn't it? This arrow. So you entered the museum uh, on the wharf and the head of the whale would be in the front. And then there was this upstairs mezzanine you could cross and go underneath the whale, um, be able to tell if it was male or female by doing so and uh, walk around the upper gallery and down. And then the walls would have various exhibits. There was an orientation map right here in the center and kind of a reception area in the corner. Now, um, just to be a little facetious, there's no way that that model is gonna fit into that building. And so that's kind of where we came up this idea with whale in a bottle. So why would you put a whale in the bottle? Well, obviously we had uh, a focus on the Santa Barbara channel and gray whales as being an icon of uh, marine mammals that move through our channel on a regular basis, migrating to Baja California and then back up to the Arctic. Um, and because of our research interest in uh, marine mammals and Chuck Woodhouse's connection to the central coast region of marine mammal stranding, we had a lot of material on gray whales and other cetaceans of the channel. So I tried to facetiously replicate, here's my building uh, and I'm going to stick that whale inside there. That kind of represents the difficulty of doing it. And of course, I've got some dish soap to help it slide through the mouth of that bottle. Here I am, and this is what I do in retirement now. Um, mess around with things like that and I tried and I tried and tried to get it in the bottle. And it's not easy, but eventually you find a way. And we did find a way. And of course, it's not really in the bottle. I just shot the picture through there and the whale's on the deck. But it kind of looks like it's in the bottle. So our uh, gray whale models were the iconic exhibit in the first sea center. And they're probably the only real uh, physical exhibit that translated from the old sea center to the new sea center. So on the left, you have the old sea center and its building and you have the new sea center with the whales and uh, also the window in the middle here to let you see the whales. Now during the day that's pretty hard to do most of the time because the ambient light is so bright. 
And at night, that's when they all really glow because there's enough light inside and it's dark outside that you can really see them in the building. Nevertheless, people can get up close. I thought it was better in the old C Center because you could get up really close and you could point the genitalia are here, those are the mammary slits, etc. <laughs> so when did the C Center start? And that's kind of a, a question I don't know the exact answer to. So I'm going to go back earlier to where I think it really did start. Um, this is a postcard of Stern's War uh, before 1973. And the yellow arrow indicates the location of the former Harbor restaurant that burned down in the early morning of 1973. I'm not sure what date or whatever. Um, so that's right there at the lower part of the wharf. And then you see buildings along here and the one that points back towards the land is known as the Y or the finger. That used to go to the land and I'll show you a picture in a moment. Uh, but it was very much a commercial operation. And uh, this building was probably for processing catch. And you see some commercial vehicles here um, and all of the open space parking. So um, I consider it the beginning of the C Center because the fire made a storm change as to how this um, pier operated. It was a commercial private enterprise. And then after the fire, the whole wharf was closed for about eight years before it was reopened to the public. Um, after the fire, the city took full responsibility, even though they had ownership, for all of the maintenance and operations. And I think they could probably forecast that this was going to be, you know, the tourist center and a money maker, uh, treasure chest, whatever it was going to be. So um, they reopened the pier in 1981, but I think it changed in scope. And it changed in scope a little bit because the square footage that the Coastal Commission would allow to be rebuilt onto the pier although it could be moved around a little bit, was exactly the same as existed at the 1973 fire. And additionally, uh, a portion of that was um, allocated to nonprofit use, uh, focused towards the channel. And fortunately, the museum, and this is where Dennis came in, um, said we would like to be a uh, education center on the wharf, and the other obvious one being the Nature Conservancy. And that was the finger of the wharf. So if you look at the, the wharf today and compare this to the postcard, oops, well, there's the Y. I was going to show you that it used to go to the beach, but uh, it was hard to maintain and fell in all the time. So it was used to get lumber to Santa Barbara. Uh, and just notice that in 1890, look at all the building on the hill across there, not a whole lot. Um, this building here is the current public parking lot on the beach there. So that's what it looked like then. And here's what it looks like in an aerial photograph today. And you can see why we talk about the Lost Sea Center, because if you go Google Sea Center or whatever, it's pretty hard to find a picture of the old Sea Center uh, or anything that goes on. In fact, it was you know, really before the digital age where people took a bazillion pictures every day. So you see today's, today's wharf is right, uh, Sea Center is right here on the finger and basically occupies that whole space now, which was nor formerly Sea Center and Nature Conservancy. This is the Harbor Restaurant. Moby Dick's is out here. This is the uh, bait tackle shop. And out at the end, I pointed out, is the Sea Center's pump house. So this is where they pick up seawater and run it all the way back on the seafloor up to that building. And we're gonna talk about a process called pigging just in a, a little bit. So Gary, that's, isn't yes. the um, Sea Center now the largest structure on Stern's Wharf? You know what, let me uh, show you the next picture. It certainly looks like it when you look at it. Um, and I don't know the true answer to that. Um, if you include second storage, store, the second story square footage, uh, it may not, and this may be an artifact of just perspective because the drone is close to this side, the harbor restaurant is like right underneath it. Obviously closer you are to the drone taking the picture, your building looks bigger. 
But looking at that perspective, it sure looks like this cluster, this building here is a lot bigger than this group and a lot bigger than Moby Dick's and shellfish. So that's a comparison of the two. And I tried to show, uh, get them in the same scale. So you see the old sea center would go from a right about there to there. And then this would be where the Nature Conservancy building is put in. And then there's all this addition. Now in this picture, you can kind of see a little extension that was made onto the sea center during my time there. So that figures significantly into the ability to add this on. And this was parking space. So they've basically taken this end of the Nature Conservancy and removed these buildings and replaced it with this one. Bigger is always better for um, such a confined space. Okay, so it also happened at the time that the museum was thinking about this Sea Center satellite facility on the wharf that the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, which had been designated in 1980, was there. And ostensibly, it's out there to protect the natural and cultural resources within a six mile boundary around the four northern Channel Islands and Santa Barbara Islands. And uh, given that, here, oh, here's a depiction of, here's the sanctuary boundary, that black line around all the islands. This is a, a rather recent map. Now there's actually areas that are designated as marine refuges for uh, recovery of marine animals, uh, fished animals particularly. The whole idea here is if you let the stocks grow into large individuals, their reproductive potential is much higher and they can repopulate uh, areas outside of those refuges. So there's no take of uh, any game within those uh, red areas within the sanctuary boundary. So it, it was a, a natural that the two would get together and collaborate because the focus is basically the same. It's on the channel, it's overlooking the channel and the amazing resources. And when you think about it, in, of all the places in the world, this channel is known for some of the highest diversity anywhere on, in the world. And it's the fact that it's on the migratory path of, of whales. Uh, whales come here to breed. You've got the islands offshore. They're kind of refuge areas for sea lions and pinnipeds. There's upwelling. The waters are very nutrient rich. So anyway, probably around 1985 or so, they got started actually building. Um, the sea center building. So this is what the site on the finger looks like now, or then, sorry, not now. Um, while that was going on, the iconic exhibit of a uh, gray whale cow, calf, and model was being undertaken at Sand City up in Monterey. And this was a shop that built all of the, the uh, whale models for the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And we're proud to say ours are the last one that came out of this shop, and therefore they are the best anatomically correct models of gray whales that they are. Although the dive is rather boring, but most gray whales, when they do their diving and they're moving, it's pretty boring. It's not until they get down to the bottom and dig things up. So while they're migrating, uh, in the lagoons of Baja, California, it's a totally different story. But anyway, you can see the, the skin here of uh, fiberglass matting that's put over this armature. And that's from one of those little three foot maquettes just cut in the pieces, blown up 12 times and then put together. And after they were completed there, they were brought down to a hangar in Santa Barbara. And imagine yourself on Highway 101 with these, this truck going by or you going by it at 70 miles an hour and looking at this, there's a, there's a whale on that truck. Anyway, they were hung there. Here's the cow. I mean, the cow and the calf right here. And Chuck Woodhouse, I hope some of you have met Chuck Woodhouse, wonderful man, and the artist of Paul Fairweather and the painted whale behind them. And they referred to uh, reference books, photographs of whales in the wild, plus Chuck's extensive collection of marine mammal strandings uh, from the beaches from the central coast and what he observed also out in the ocean. And you have to remember at this time, the museum was actually involved with uh, whale watching trips uh, aboard the Condor. So during that season, 
we regularly had docents on the morning trips on the weekends, uh, providing additional interpretation and materials that people could hold on those trips. Um, in particular, on this flipper, you see kind of these striations here. And that was actually observed in a stranded specimen. Um, and these are tooth rakes from a killer whale or an orca where it had grabbed onto the flipper and just kind of mauled it a little bit there. And then the whale had, had uh, repaired or recovered it. It didn't uh, perish from this encounter, some other cause. So um, while that was occurring, the uh, rest of the sea center is being built. Here's the mezzanine where you're going to cross over. And this whale is going to span over the top of that. And you're going to be able to walk right underneath it. <clears throat> so then the museum hit on the best PR idea that they've had in a while. It's like, how are we going to get these whales to the sea center so we can install them? And the great idea, because the oil industry was so active at the time, was we'll get petroleum helicopters to carry it and drop it by air onto the wharf. Um, I was always led to believe that the uh, whale was just too long. You couldn't make the turn on the wharf. But, you know, come on, just, just take it off, put it on the carriage. You could have rolled it all the way out there and had a parade. Anyway, so there it is. And so it was flown from the airport uh, out over the ocean. Uh, people were encouraged to look out at a particular time of the day, and this whale would be flying across. And eventually it was brought to the sea center. The wharf was full of people, and uh, they were kept away from the finger of the wharf while the whale was landed. And then they were led over to that side and welcomed to come up and pet the whale and look at it up close. You'll see that the barnacle patches uh, on this, those are applied um, as an extra uh, molding onto the whale, and gray whales are just covered with barnacles. And we made national news, so the, the footage of this, Dennis Power talking to the reporter on ABC, could be NBC, I don't know, it cuts off right there, uh, news. So that's, uh, that was quite a kudo. So it was a publicity stunt. It was marketing. It's to get notice that the museum is here, and we're going to be putting that inside the building. And that was the work for the next day. So how and calf pair, uh, photo op, and it's going to go through that window, the problem being that the width of the flukes is wider than that opening. So they had to take a good part of a full day with it rigged up inside and outside with this um, crane to get the whale through that window. And they had to rotate it about 45 degrees, get it in and then let it go back and then crank up the, the flukes and the tail stock up over while supporting it the entire time. That's not the end of the story. So once the whale in, you've got to decorate it some more so that around the patches of barnacles, gray whales are just lousy, lousy. I guess that word, whale lumps. I think they're kind of amphipod that they get on there and it kind of chews at the dead skin and between the, the barnacles thing. So um, that's where they get that. And then we also had a gray whale skeleton uh, fully articulated that was uh, from the museum's collections and put together by an intern, Paula White. So the last assembly occurred here and then it was hoisted up in the space uh, behind uh, the full-scale models. And of course, we had an opening, as we always do. Um, and I think uh, at this time, we had the topographic map, the whale models, the whale skeleton. We probably had a gallery exhibit around the open space and most of the flat walls. And we had the aquariums uh, running. The only problem here is that we turned on the water the afternoon of this opening. And the water around Stern's Wharf is really not very clean. It's often very turbid. Sometimes you can't even see past your, your face. And um, that was one of those days. So the new water we put up in the sea center that would eventually filter itself uh, would clear. But uh, for the opening, it did not. So these tanks were totally full of marine animals and cloudy. Nobody could see a thing. And Dennis Powers was saying, well, these are the aquarium. And uh, 
There's lots of fish in there, believe me. But the other thing about the Santa Barbara Channel is it's very rich and the plankton blooms are just incredible. So we have a plankton bloom happening here and uh, come back next week, it'll look great. Unfortunately, next week didn't come right away. So um, we had a fire about a week after we opened and uh, it was one of those windy, windy days. Now, I don't know if there are any myths about the fire, but there might be some myths about um, somebody was sleeping on a deck underneath here, a homeless person, and started a little fire under the pier, um, dropped cigarette, whatever, or a catalytic converter dropped down and started a fire, um, which are actually plausible ideas in a way because the, the pier is built of wood. It's the oldest wooden wharf in California, although I would say not one timber is original from 1872, but um, it's treated with creosote, which is highly flammable. And I'm here to tell you that there was a short in a circuit to one of the seawater pumps on that platform underneath there that um, got hot and caught fire against one of the timbers. And from there, it was a very windy day, and it just propagated throughout the, that section of the war, driven by the wind outside of the sea center. So it was basically a pier fire driven up the back of the sea center, producing this huge uh, smoke cloud. Um, it was actually put out reasonably quickly, but the aftermath, as you can expect, looked horrible. And our poor neighbor got smoke damaged, and that's just the uh, ash and everything deposited on that side, no actual burn damage. Uh, all of the sheeting on the outside got burned off. Fortunately, none of the pilings were damaged to the extent that they had to be replaced, so they were good. And um, a lot of glass broke when the whales were inside. And just got a little bit of blister on the window, on the window side here, facing east. So that's something that we could repair. Wouldn't have to remove them from the building. And uh, all the other debris from the fireman's work and glass broken in here, easily cleaned up and things like that. So over the space of the year, we rebuilt the exhibits that were in there and cleaned everything up and rebuilt that part of the building. Excuse me. And uh, reopened again. Now, what, what did we learn from that fire? You know, fire can be a disastrous thing. It's just kind of one of those things that happen. You just have to turn around and look at, okay, so what, what's the light in it? What's the opportunity that happened? Well, one of the things they learned was really safety on the wharf. How do you, how do you prevent a fire from propagating on those flammable timbers? And so the city came up with a deluge system. They have pipes that are set up that make water curtains and section off the wharf, depending on where a fire starts. And fires start, unfortunately, all the time on the wharf. Even post Sea Center, there have been little cigarette butt fires on the planks. Moby Dick's had a fire. Uh, you name it. There's been fires, there's been pilings, there's been boats breaking off and running into the pier. Um, it's just part of life out there. Uh, the other thing they learned was we're not going to ever let you put electric coal that goes down through the slab underneath the pier ever again. So you've got to do all your activity, pumps and everything, up on the deck. No electrical goes through. So that, that's also a very good thing that came out of it. And then for us, we gained a ton of time. We had an exhibit book. We needed to develop more exhibits for this space. So we were able to develop, uh, let's see, I even have a list here. Well, here's an outdoor bird exhibit. These are models of gulls and terns that were on this outdoor platform. You look out the window. Um, no pigeons ever landed here. Uh, here's our aquaria backup piling. This is our reef tank, which we call the Boris tank. And you'll have to ask me why we call it Boris tank. A flatfish tank, a jewel tank, uh, exhibit on marine archaeology. Uh, more exhibits down here. We had some more comparative exhibits between uh, odontocetes, which are tooth whales, and mystocetes, baleen whales, how you tell the difference, um, and so on. 
Uh, and over the next three years, we continue to add exhibits occasionally that, that would come in over time. <clears throat> One of the things, oh, if I go back, let me go back just a second. I forgot about the touch tank. The first touch tank was something that I manufactured in our backyard and we just pushed out the back door when it was convenient or when we had school tours and needed to make it a station. Um, so this is me in my younger age. Maybe a little, I'm a little heavier now, but I'm certainly a lot grayer up there. But, um, anyway, so we ended up using this tank eventually in uh, a mobile fashion where we used it out on the Condor for ocean going trips. Um, but we, I always knew there was something better, you know, with touch tank. And I thought that this was one of the um, focal things that we could do. And we applied for coastal resource enhancement fund monies through the county, which the, the county collects basically as a tax on the petroleum industry. And so it's a competitive thing, depending on your district, whether you could get uh, money or not, we were successful in getting this expansion made. And we were very clever to make this expansion as just open air footprint that went outside where we could gather people and teach them more about the marine environment a little up close. So our whole idea is we have a set of tanks with an interpreters nearby in this center area. They're allowed to come out if they want to. And times when we can let people sit on uh, the benches around here and actually do a program related to that. Other, other than that, when there's not a program running, it's basically a self-service operation. You know, you're welcome to ask us questions. We encourage touching and feeling, but we had rules about it, uh, which was the one finger rule. And we even developed, Sarah, do you remember that graphic that we developed with a finger touching the end of an octopus and a spark? Yes. Anyway, that's old history. Um, so this is our original shark tank. We had little swell sharks in there, so on. Uh, and of course, it was outdoor. It was, we did have to create some kind of shade. But what's important here is this is square footage utilized for the museum uh, and sea center program. And then we use the outdoor spaces on the form that Sarah's going to talk about um, for just amping up the uh, education program. Um, one of the other things we did that I think um, the Today Sea Center benefited from is we were finding the Sea Center had a hard time with visibility across the wharf. We had a beautiful sign. It said Sea Center. Nobody really knew what that meant, Sea Center. And the letters were kind of small. It wasn't big enough, but it was, you know, four by three. Um, we created this sign and I was told to go in front of the sign committee and unbeknownst to me as a novice, I had such great success, even though technically I see this as a banner, we called it a sign and we fixed it to the side and put letters in eight inch letters, museum aquarium, so that people knew what we had in there. <clears throat> and we got through without any discussion and I, I just don't think that was realistic but anyway the point is that today's sea center gets around this banner sign issue because it had one in the old sea center uh, this is the pump house uh, out at the end so there's the bait and tackle shop uh, the, so this was part of that grant to put in the pump house and collect water from here pump it up onto the deck where the pumps were and then pump it back down uh, on the seafloor bottom all the way back to the sea center where it's then distributed. Um, we also put in interpretive signs uh, along the whole length of the wharf about natural history items, you know, the sandy beach, birds of the harbor, uh, fish of the harbor, the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, what, what's under, on a pier piling underneath. Um, so those are all out there. Free of charge, just walk in the wharf, Help yourself. Um, so one of the things that Tommy Wilson, uh, the aquarist at today's Sea Center talked about was pigging. And I wanted to just clarify that a little bit. So there's, there's two 
dual lines that go, and one of them is delivering fresh seawater all the time. The other one is basically bad. No water is moving, or it may even be filled with fresh water. And the reason for doing that are particles, especially, that will grow in that flowing water. And so this is a gooseneck barnacle and acorn barnacles. And if you allow them to get too big, there's no way you're going to get a thing that's called a pig, which are these things that come in various densities through there. But you need to clean your pipe even after it sits fallow because there's debris and mud, stuff like that in there. And you use the pig to do that and a pump or the C center pump itself to blow that pig down the line and out where it comes out the other end along with all this black stinky mud for a while until it runs clear. And then you can switch over and use that line and let the other one go down. And with that, I have talked too much. So I'm gonna let Sarah go from here for a while. Thanks, Gary. Away. Um. Well, I thank the audience for joining us, and I'd just like to thank the museum um, for hiring me as a young person that uh, dreamed of being a marine ecologist. Um, and now I'm back again for a second tour, so I'm able to keep my gills wet. Um, <laughs> so, so anyways, um, I came on board. Uh, I was hired by Gary Robinson. Thank you, Gary. Um, You're welcome in the, uh, the 90s. And um, uh, during that period of time, the museum entered into a cooperative agreement with the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. It was a grant that allowed the museum um, to get more personnel to um, provide marine education. Um, and the sanctuary then had uh, people at this visitor center that could deliver programs and also give the sanctuary more of a presence. Um, uh, a lot of the things that we did at the Sea Center um, back in the 90s are, are integrated into programs that we have today. Um, uh, the idea of hands-on teaching and really getting uh, visitors, especially children, um, to get up close and personal with marine life and really appreciate it is a way to create a breeding ground for future marine um, biologists that can do more to protect the ocean. So um, this is Michelle Kendall, who's now married to Bruce Kendall, a professor at UCSB. And um, she started at the museum as um, someone trained as a docent. She was the youngest docent ever trained. And um, from that point, she worked for Quasars to Sea Stars, which is a program in existence today. And she volunteered, then interned at the Sea Center, became a part-time employee, um, and, and so on. So a lot of the copy on this slide, but basically um, the Sea Center had an opportunity in the 90s to really flesh out its education programs. We had something uh, for for everyone from basically cradle to to the end um, and uh, hopefully we were developing future legends of the ocean um, so we trained docents and uh, college interns we had a huge amount of interns um, working with us from the local schools UCSB Westmont um, City College, and then we would even have interns that would come from as far as Massachusetts interning during their winter break. Um, our school programs went from K through college age. We did a variety of public programs, especially uh, summer programs. Um, the Sea Center also served as a film set um, for a National Geographic documentary. We actually turned our our back uh, uh, utility area it was a classroom as well, but we also turned it into a film set where uh, we could, uh, the cinematographer, it was Mike Degree. Uh, he was able to film inside of a holdfast, um, never been done before. We also even worked on a TV series with Jeff Corwin. Um, we used to do things like study Grunion um, uh, and uh, count eggs and see how many eggs hatched out. Um, that was part, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Gary, of a harbor dredging research project. Um, we started doing live um, 
underwater nighttime dive broadcasts, which was a huge success. We had a, a nighttime outdoor theater. We had divers diving, filming uh, grebes swimming underwater, fish swimming underwater, underwater pumpkin carving because it was done in October. We also did um, the first national live um, underwater dive broadcast that was um, streamed to the web. It was something sponsored by GTE, which is now Verizon. And the signal was broadcast to school kids um, visiting these tour buses that were going all over the country. So it was a time where we really were able to innovate a lot of programs. So this just gives you an idea of um, kids very much like it is today coming to the Sea Center. These are some of our wonderful docents. The gentleman in the blue um, was Brooke Sawyer, a wonderful friend of the museum. Um, there I am uh, wearing my overalls, covering up um, my second child who was um, incubating at the time. Um, we developed uh, in conjunction with the Marine Sanctuary um, some wonderful courses. We had one called Oceanographer for a Day and some of the things that we taught in that class is still taught at the Sea Center and where I work as an interpreter. I work with some of the same equipment like Secchi Disc, Van Dorn Bottle for water sampling, um, plankton towing. And if we go to the next slide, we taught kids um, from, a, uh, these are some acknowledgements of who was involved in it. Uh, both the sanctuary and the museum team, but we would teach kids all about microscopic studies of plankton and teach them how to identify plant and animal plankton. And we also did a wonderful course called Life in a Drop of Seawater. I loved that course because we would spawn sea urchins and show kids how life begins for a sea urchin by taking um, uh, the egg and sperm from the sea urchins and mixing them together. And by the end of the hour, kids would actually see uh, the beginnings of a multicellular sea urchin right in front of them on a video microscope. So these are just some pictures of the things that we did teaching in outside. We used the outside deck of the Sea Center for a lot of our uh, classroom activities. And at any one day in two hours, we would have taught at least 60 children. Um, and we would do that four days a week. Um, almost rain or shine. <laughs> During this period of time that I was there working with Gary at the Sea Center, the museum um, participated with the Marine Sanctuary on the fabulous Los Marineros program for fifth and sixth graders. And it was a wonderful curriculum that was integrated. So reading math, science, English, history were all integrated. Kids learned the history of the Chumash people, but everything had a marine theme. And kids would come to the Sea Center. So every fifth grader in the Santa Barbara School District came to the Sea Center. And uh, they'd also go out to the Channel Islands. It was a really rich program. And what's so exciting is today at the Butterfly Exhibit, people will come by and say, oh, I remember seeing the Sea Center. Uh, when I was a kid, um, you know, I would, they would share that, oh yeah, um, I remember that program and now I'm an adult and now I'm bringing my child to the Sea Center. And there are even grandparents that are, young grandparents that are now bringing their kids to the Sea Center and the museum. Um, one of the things that I think was very exciting um, for the Sea Center team, um, certainly for me, it's one of the the happiest times in my life was having the opportunity to develop the whale core um, right down to the jackets we wore. And the idea behind this was to provide um, another way for us to serve the public um, on the water. And uh, we uh, trained a docent or a, a, a class of about 75, 80 people in our first cohort. And they would go out on whale watching vessels, beginning with the condor, and um, do lots of interpretive activities. So this is our graduating class. Um, Gary's in there somewhere. A, a very young Sarah is uh, in the center holding flowers. Uh, this was the graduation sort of shakedown cruise. Um, and I'm really happy to say today, even though the whale core is now called the naturalist core, and it was taken on by the sanctuary 
after the museum and the sanctuary um, did not renew their cooperative agreement. Um, I'm so happy it still exists today. And I, sadly, I didn't get to go on this cruise after all the training. Um, at that time, being six months pregnant, I just wasn't allowed to go to sea. So anyways, at least I got to <laughs> get my picture taken. Um, other innovative things we got to do was um, participate in a whale festival on Stearns Wharf to help the other business people on the wharf um, draw more attention, get more business during the, the less touristy season uh, in the winter or early spring whale watching season. And we developed this cool little passport booklet. Um, sponsors, businesses would sponsor each page and um, all the different whales and dolphin species that are found in the sanctuary or actually in the Santa Barbara Channel were featured in this passport booklet. So um, there are companies that are still in existence on Stearns Wharf today that were sponsors of this little booklet and our whale core team would then hand them out or sell them I think for a dollar on, on the condor. So a little bit more about the passport. We also developed something called um, the week of the whale uh, lots of fun whale oriented activities during the late winter, early spring at the museum. And I, I remember fondly Gary and I working on building um, an inflatable whale that people could um, crawl through and there would be all kinds of things inside of it like like bones from whales and and krill and other things to kind of illustrate, you know, the, the size of these animals, the scale and their importance. Um, Actually, these pictures were not from the Week of the Whale. Um, the museum used to have member appreciation days um, back then, as they do now. And um, we wanted the Sea Center to have presents during um, these member appreciation events. And so we designed these wonderful costumes. So I'm wearing the, the big Sea Star costume. <laughs> and my son, uh, Nick, who was four years old at the time. He was the baby sea star. And our colleague, Jennifer Gray, was a decorator crab, complete with a, a eggs in her brooding patch. <laughs> so uh, these were a big hit, and they were also worn in the summer solstice parade. Um, I see that there's a chat question, so I'm just going to check that really quick. What was my favorite education program? That's a hard one. Um, the Whale Corps was wonderful. Um, I loved the summer of the sharks where we did a shark cruise uh, with Rocky Strong, who's a shark biologist that was featured on Shark Week. And uh, we, we'd have cinematographers and researchers who knew everything about white sharks and others come and give presentations. Um, and yes, I was at the Sea Center during the Moby Dick fire when that broke out. And uh, that was very interesting and also a little scary because we had to release a lot of animals and we didn't know what our future was going to be in terms of teaching. And so, so the point of that was that uh, the pump house was actually damaged in that fire, right? And that was, you didn't have fresh seawater you could deliver. That's right. That's right. Um, this was a fun program too called Celebration. Both the museum and the Sea Center campuses would run these concurrent summer programs. And I love the idea of being able to go back into our invertebrate zoology collection and be able to pull out specimens. And uh, we built a, a beautiful display at the Sea Center that was temporary showing how shells figure prominently in the culture of the Chumash people. Um, so that was fun. So that's an example of our programming that we did concurrently with the main campus. Um, this was another program I just really loved was we would do these cruises um, aboard the Condor. We would have divers in the water that would collect once we got to Santa Cruz Island and then we would have an onboard touch tank uh, presentation. And uh, this was right near Painted Cave, I believe. Yeah. So this was super fun. Definitely a highlight. Gary participated in this and was involved in building up this program, these underwater photography workshops. I think, I'm not sure, I think these were aboard um, the Vision or one of the Truth Aquatic vessels. And we had um, 
Tom Campbell, who uh, was a highway patrolman, but um, developed a second uh, career as an underwater cinematographer and photographer. And so people um, uh, learned all kinds of underwater photographic techniques. And you can see everybody's working on their gear here in, in the galley of the vessel. I like to think of the Sea Center as a breeding ground for future legends. Um, there are a lot of people that came through the Sea Center as uh, interns, um, volunteers, uh, students who really went on in life. They used the Sea Center as a trampoline or springboard into their career. So this is Scott Simon, who was a diver collector. He started out as a volunteer, then went part time. And then today he's at UCSB and he's the director of the research and environmental uh, education um, uh, facility at UCSB. And our next legend, next slide. Well, I, want, I want to point out on this one so I can't forget. So we eventually did get a roof over the outdoor touch tank area, permanent roof. And this was made possible by a donation from Virginia Sloan uh, honorary trustee of the museum um, currently. And uh, so this was probably the last uh, great piece of addition to the Sea Center that I actually saw, um, but it was much needed. Yeah, definitely. Um, we had an opportunity to actually not get quite so exposed to the elements because it gets quite cold out on Stern's Wharf. And it's all thanks to that first touch tank footprint and the little canopy over the touch tank that helped build the case along with Gary's um, innovation and Virginia Sloan support to get that um, roof, uh, open air roof put uh, up for the, the uh, touch tank area. Uh, again, Michelle McCutcheon, what I, uh, well, Michelle Kendall now, uh, what I love about this is, you know, we were equal opportunity for um, our female students and our male students. And she went on to be a, a staff person and a diver collector. And this is just great for the young girls. We would teach just to see that, hey, you two can study marine biology and, and uh, work your way up. So she's not holding a, uh, a clump of goo, she's holding um, a large uh, colonial tunicate that we call sea pork. And Blair Mott, uh, Blair started out as a volunteer from City College and he has a marvelous story. He went on to um, become a part-time staff person. He was instrumental in um, preparing uh, whale specimens for us, very difficult work. And he was hired uh, by a company called Passage Productions, working with Jean-Michel Cousteau on cruise ships going all around the world doing underwater um, uplink programs. And today now he's working at Kirby Morgan. Uh, it's a commercial diving company that manufactures um, uh, hard hat diving equipment. And he's a trainer uh, uh, for their organization. And here we are, this is the Sea Center today in all of its glory. And this was taken back probably in the spring when COVID-19 first hit all of us. And we had the opportunity to bathe the Sea Center in blue uh, to thank all of our first responders and, and people working in the medical industry on the front lines of the pandemic. So um, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Gary and Sarah. A very interesting slice of the museum and our community's uh, past. Uh, we're getting kind of short on time. I know, Sarah, you answered a couple of questions. I, I'll have one more for you. Um, besides the whale, are there any other exhibits that remained as part of the new Sea Center? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the signage panels uh, identifying marine mammals, those have all been repurposed um, at the Sea Center. And some of our oceanographic equipment is the very same that I used, gosh, I want to say like 25, 30 years ago, in the 90s. Our Secchi disc, the same Secchi disc, Van Doren bottle, Ekman grab. I think we've worn out a few of those and had to purchase new ones. Um, but um, yeah, we're, there's, there's a few more things I think. Oh, there's this incredible old microscope viewer 
that we still use at the C Center that was there when I started. And Gary, uh, one last thing, a uh, question just came in about, do you have time to tell us the story of the fish print? The unique fish print? The fish print? Yeah, oh, the big print. scale prompt print. So, yeah. so we get a call from, uh, this is what I worked out at the uh, Marine Biology Lab with Shane Anderson. We got a call from uh, somebody we didn't know, a lady who had been walking on uh, a campus beach there between Goleta Pier and the campus point with her friend and they're walking in the surf a little bit, getting their feet wet. And this fish just jumps out of the water and lands right in front of them and goes blah, 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 like pick me up. And that big scale pumper is well, it's about two and a half feet in length. And you can see it's a very fast swimming fish, like a tuna, very the lunate tail. And it had just been alive, it just plopped on the surf. So they're kind of a rare fish. Um, the time that we got it, uh, and thank the, thankfully they called us, um, there were probably about a dozen, no more than a dozen known specimens from Southern California. So when you looked in the Miller and Lee fish guide, it was you know, very rare, it was very rare. Um, I'm not so sure that's the case now. But anyway, of course, we, we called Eric right away and said, this is going to make a great fish print. <laughs> and so we spent all night in the lab printing this fish. And on my picture, you can see the eyes just a little dirty around the eye. That's the only part you're allowed to actually hand paint in. That's because it kind of bled out a little bit as we're pushing down to transfer the ink. And um, that night when I went home, the Sycamore Canyon fire was fully engulfed, I had no idea. I drove Shane Anderson home on the Mesa and turned around and looked at the Riviera and it's fully engulfed in flames. And I get up to my house there and everybody's driving crazy and they're packing up their cars and the smoke's going out and just everything broke loose. We had no idea any of that was going on while we we're busy doing this fish print until about midnight. So later on, this fish now is in the LA County Museum uh, because they, they had more interest in fish collections than we did at the time. Um, but we did get a call from the ichthyologist and said, what happened to its eye? <laughs> and Eric, because he wanted to get a nice, good, crisp print, removed the eye before he printed the fish again. <laughs> so that's the story behind it. Now you you can say it's a myth or something like that, and Gary made it up. Nobody's going to call you on it. But that's the story. Awesome. Well, unfortunately, our time is up. Um, but again, I'd like to thank Gary Robinson and Sarah Evans Sterner for sharing your time, your enthusiasm, your knowledge. And if Gary, if you would go to the last slide in your PowerPoint. Yes. I would appreciate it. <laughs> it there. Here it goes. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so folks, don't miss next week's Legends of the Halls, Digging into an Archaeologist's Past, on Thursday, August 13th, with our Curator of Anthropology, Dr. John Johnson, as he takes an up-close and personal look at David Banks Rogers, who founded the Museum's Department of Anthropology back in 1925. The Legends of the Halls series is presented by the Leadership Circles of Giving, and if you're interested in learning more about this important philanthropic level of membership, including some great benefits like specialized field trips with our curators or behind the scenes science salons, please feel free to call me at the museum at extension 124 or email bdivine at sbnature2.org as you see on the screen. And Gary and Sarah would also welcome any additional questions you might have. Uh, they also both volunteer at the Butterfly Pavilion so you can run into them there here at the museum. So feel free to email me and I'll provide you with their contact information. Lastly, our thanks to all of you for joining us and for your continued generous support to the museum and Sea Center. And don't forget to stay connected by visiting our website often at sbnature.org. Take care everybody and have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. -bye.